Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the presentation. Today I'll be presenting TUG RSE, pulling students into research software engineering. So first of all, who am I? I'll give a little background. Uh, I did my undergrad in computer science and mathematics from the University of Delhi. Uh, I completed that last year. I was an IRSF fellow, which was what introduced me to research software and this wonderful community. Uh, so after that, I did uh, this program called OLS, which is an open science program to develop and apply open science principles to any project that you have, which is a culmination uh, of how this project came to be. And uh, okay. then I joined the University of Manchester recently uh, in about January, and I'm an SSI fellow this year. So that's sort of my background. And currently I'm doing uh, an R I have an RSE position at the University of Manchester. So the next slide is about you. So this is not me having a crisis, but I would like to know what kind of audience we have in the room. So the question I have for you is, how many years of higher education or professional experience did you have before you became an RSE or had a similar role? So, oops, for example, say if you did your undergrad and it took three to four years, you just choose the option for three to four years. If you did an undergrad and then had some work experience or some masters, you choose the relevant years. Basically, how many years of education you had after high school before you became an RSC, just to get an idea of what kind of distribution we have across the room. Uh, you should be able to see the question on Slido. Okay, I hope we do have online responses by now. Uh, okay. So as the responses are still pouring in, so uh, I'll not share the screen because it's too much hassle for now, but we, the results show that, okay, 34% uh, people have 10 plus years of experience, then 23% people have nine to 10 years of experience, then seven to eight, then five to six, and 13% of people have zero to four experience be before they became an RSC. So I'm glad the hypothesis pulled through. Would have been a shame if it didn't, but, uh, that's what we see the general trend is that when we look at RSEs across areas in industry, in academia, in public sector, we notice that we do not have a lot of people who did just their undergrad or who just graduated and started uh, with the RSE job. Generally, they have a lot of experience when they transition into it. So this is from the uh, international survey, uh, the RSE international survey that Neil mentioned earlier. And this was the results that we had. So we had 40% people who had a doctorate, 25% people who had masters, and then the numbers just keep going down for different kinds of degrees. Uh, so this is a cropped image. This is not the full scale of things, but there were a lot of 0% 0 uh, 0 scales in that which I cropped. And uh, this is from the survey, if, if you want to check it out. And uh, this, this sort of shows how, again, as uh, comes line in, in line with the room, that we have a lot of doctorates and masters uh, for people who did an RSC position or have an RSC position and uh, are now currently. So what is the fuss about? Research software engineering is a welcoming field, and yet the entry barrier is still a little, a little high. Uh, one still mostly requires a PhD or master's degree and experience to become an RSC. And a lot of RSEs have trans transitioned into the RSE role by realizing they were an RSE already. So that's the common conversation, right? That people were doing this position in, with a different title for all their years and maybe still are. And uh, they realized they were an RSC and then transitioned into the role or uh, are still in another role, but are doing a similar kind of job. And these are not necessarily bad things, but we can still advocate for an easier entry. So why could this be a lack of awareness and background, unsuitable skill set, scarcity of entry routes, imposter syndrome, and lack of diversity and inclusion. So for lack of awareness and background, students are rarely even aware of the option and typical computer science routes are there like software developer jobs and research or higher studies, but there does not exist a route which typically tell students, okay, that you can be at the intersection of both these points and they might stumble upon it accidentally uh, via open source or research work. 
then unsuitable skill set that is uh, another i think common reason that when i talk to people when i talk to uh, people who are hiring research of engineers and i ask them okay why is it difficult to hire directly after uh, after just an undergrad or students who are just getting into the industry because skills are not of, often oriented to rsc and if involved by software development they have a more cs oriented approach if involved by research they have the more just get it to run approach which is i think with a lot of people's in people in grad schools where it might not follow best practices but hey it, it at least runs and then there's a scarcity of entry routes which is a lack of position for beginners uh, some standard positions ask for phd's minimum and all the available positions are too spread out so that is again how we spread out positions by hiring uh, and also we see like in the trends when we receive job applications that there is a lack of responses throughout then imposter syndrome this was again i think a big theme across wherein people across their careers have this uh, barrier because students have an imposter syndrome while entering say a new job or academia but even like i imagine like a lot of us in this room would have experienced this at some point or the other or might still do and job descriptions having intimidating requirements is another thing that puts a lot of students off and then lack of diversity and inclusion so according to the rsc interactive survey 79.48% of the participants were made and uh, this is a quote from roland mosbergen's uh, wonderful wonderful uh, diverse uh, talk uh, and he said that lack of diversity in the workforce that leads to a lack of opportunity for people from marginalized groups so that is that is often the case wherein we might not be able to compare merit equally so rolin talks a lot about redefining merit how to compare people at different scales it might not be uh, all the same for people who have a phd versus who do not because of their backgrounds because of their identities because they might come from a group which is underrepresented already now what could help so to tackle a lack of awareness outreach and word of mouth and this is a slow process but we can do it slowly and we've been doing it already and we have somewhat of a large community now uh cut through the jargon not everyone knows what research software is it is important for us to not get caught up in the jargon and acronyms we have way too many acronyms and minor changes like using language that assumes no context can be really helpful for welcoming more people into the field then to tackle the unsuitable skill sets masters courses uh, so work is already being done by edinburgh oxford imperial and southampton i believe they are collaborating on designing a masters course for rsc which i imagine would be really helpful uh, interest has been expressed by the us rsc community so the princeton computing group in particular is also keen on getting a masters course uh, off the ground to tackle the unsuitable skill sets more student level opportunities and training so google summer of code the rsf fellowship university of manchester has a near industry program where we have students in their uh, uh, student computer science students come to us work with us for a year and see what it's like being uh, an rsc then princeton university recently started rsc internships the ssi has research software camps collaborations workshop the ols training program and carpentry training so there's a lot that we're doing already and yet we do not have a lot of people which end up joining us as rscs then to tackle the scarcity of entry routes more rsc openings i guess that is an obvious more entry level positions uh, the ucl rolling recruitment program which i believe is is uh, quite a good way to get more people interested because you can send an application throughout the year and you can hear from them about the job uh, throughout uh, regardless of what hiring period it is in so the rolling recruitment program i believe is a good example of that too to tackle the imposter syndrome uh, friendly job descriptions this is again something that uh, i think uh, i came across while i personally was applying to different rsc positions that there was this uh, sort of scale wherein some job descriptions would be describing the same thing but in very different words which can be very intimidating so friendly job descriptions are definitely helpful 
and to make people realize it is not always a hard requirement because I, I imagine like yeah, that we, we often know that to get into a job, you do not have to fulfill all of the requirements in, in that job description to the dot, but a lot of people do not realize it. And as a result, they end up not applying for the position itself. Then transparency and support for job applicants. Uh, the Allen Turing Institute has drop-in sessions during hiring, which I believe are really helpful, wherein uh, the candidates can just drop in, ask uh, questions that they have about the job, or even like get an idea if they they are suitable for the position or if they should apply, or uh, what what kind of uh, job, what kind of things that they need to do on the job. Then the UCL and the carpentries provide context ahead of the interview and feedback after, which is again very helpful which helps uh, especially people with neurodivergence with the uh, interviews wherein there is uh, there is that element wherein you already have the questions, you know what you're going in for. Then to tackle the lack of diversity and inclusion, systemic changes, so policy improvements, redefining merit, and as I talked about uh, earlier, role and stock. So this is not an area that I have expertise in and would not be able to comment on it a lot, but I would highly recommend watching Roland Stock and exploring the work of, of Diverse, which I think is being done by Jeremy Cohen and one other person that I'm blanking the name on. But uh, this is a wonderful series within the RSC community, which talks a lot about diversity. And uh, throughout this talk, Roland talked, talked about a lot of radical changes, a lot about systemic changes that we need uh, to address the issues that we have in the community and how we can always be more inclusive, how we can always be more diverse. Now, this is uh, yet another RSC resource, which is the Undergraduate's Guide to Research Software Engineering. So this is something I've been working on a, uh, as a part of my SSI fellowship and at the University of Manchester. This is still in its early stages, but the aim of this resource is to provide information and background of research software engineering to people uh, this was something we discovered at Collaborations Workshop that even though we do have a lot of context provided already on, say, the US RSC or the UK RSC website, it still assumes a baseline where people know something about research software already. And it is uh, still important to address it to people who might not have any context at all. So to, to just have people uh, enter RSC without having any context would be really helpful. Training and education resources a job board for entry-level positions. So that is, again, uh, I discovered since jobs are very spread out throughout the community, it's difficult to find a lot of entry-level positions and support and community engagement resources. So these are the four sort of pillars that uh, we want to base this resource on. Uh, here's the link for the resource. Uh, it's right now, it's mostly an empty Jupyter book. Uh, but if you want to follow, uh, follow up with this, please feel free to. And yeah, I think that's my time. And these are some questions I have for you, but I would welcome any questions, comments, uh, whatever you think. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with the first question. Um, is the lack of diversity in the workforce responsible for a lack of opportunity or simply a lack of our appeal for marginalized groups? They are two different things. Uh, again, as I said, I am not an expert on this, so I would not pretend to be. But from what I understand, it's both. So since it, it is uh, the lack of diversity and it is the lack of, say, uh, explicit uh, steps to welcome my, more diversity, uh, it might lead to lack of opportunity. And then there is, of course, I think the lack of appeal to since people might not feel very comfortable being in groups where they are uh, very underrepresented. But yeah, that's that's what I can make of it. Did the survey include junior RSE positions? Many groups are offering these positions now, um, and they are a great way to get into the field. Uh, yeah, I think uh, they had some junior RSE positions uh, within the survey that it mentioned. But I imagine, like since the survey was taken up till now, there have been some positive changes. So we are seeing more junior RSE positions. But I believe that there is still room for a lot more of these positions because there is still that gap wherein we're targeting people who might already be RSEs or people who might already be doing the work rather than people who might potentially be RSEs. So 
say with internships or air industry programs, we might be able to get more people. But uh, yeah, I think it's it's a great thing that we have more positions which are being offered to junior RCs. Thank you. For a standard role, do you think that we do need to have some level of industry academic experience? Uh, yes, I do believe that there has to be some level of experience that you have or some context that you have because say for me, I realized uh, even though I did have only an undergrad degree, I had worked with research software before and I knew what it's like working with an RSC team, which helped. Uh, but again, I think there has to be that sort of, uh, we have to address that gap wherein there is a student who has just come out of their degree and there is this job, but it's it's either like a PhD or a postdoc and then you get to the job. But uh, if we have that gap filling mechanism somehow, wherein maybe they have some experience, uh, some way to get that, gain that experience or just know what kind of uh, industry or academic skills that they need to develop. So I think it works both ways, wherein people who have al always had pure research backgrounds they might need to catch up with some of the computer science skills and the other way around wherein people with pure software development skills might need to know more research context. But yeah, I think I think there is certainly a need for both of those things. Okay, next question. What is the benefit of bringing in junior low-skilled RSEs into small teams that are already burdened by too many projects and don't have time to train new members? Okay, that is... Good question. Uh, not, not one I have particularly a good answer for. But yeah, I believe like one is just expanding the community. Like that. That sounds that sounds very preachy, but it's it's more or less again like the benefit to having more junior low skilled people is one you expand the community, you get more people into the field and expand the field itself. But two, it does not again, have to be like at an influx. I think we again have a good model for this uh, at Manchester, wherein uh, the junior people that we have, and again, I believe like junior versus low skilled can be two different things. So that does not have to be concurrent at all times. But yeah, junior RSCs uh, in the team that we had uh, and the air industry people that we worked with, they were highly skilled students. So it, it did not, I believe, like burden a lot of the team. So it definitely, we had definitely had to take out time for them and we definitely have that onboarding period wherein they might be paired up with someone in the team or they might still be on the learning curve. But I think there is that certain, uh, certain benefit to it wherein uh, the, the cost of having those people versus the cost of training them are two different things wherein I believe that we might benefit more from having them there versus the cost of training them in the first place. Thank you. Um, should we not have RSE lectures, practicals as part of all undergraduate degrees in the same way that most undergraduate degrees include computing analysis programming modules? Yeah, I mean, if we could have that, uh, that would be a lovely thing. And that is being tried, uh, as I talked about, uh, by the collaboration here in the UK and the US RSE, where they are looking at how do we get more RSE skills into the academic programs. But yeah, I think that is something that we need to look at a larger scale. And uh, it would be lovely if we had those elements, because I think I got really lucky during my degree, wherein I was exposed to the RSC skills and RSC part of the degree. But I think that is not very common in any of the places. And that would be a positive change to have. Um, main problem starting out was the huge variety of RSE skills. So hard to decide what training is I needed. Do I want to be a machine learning specialist, HPC, data scientist, generalist? Uh, I think that is a double-edged sword because that is uh, with any field, right? Like if I want to become a software developer, I will still have these choices. So I believe like it, it is very transferable in the sense that say I want to work on scientific computing as a software developer, but I realize, okay, there exists a role an adjacent RSE role that I can do for the same thing or say for HPC or say for data science. Uh, yeah, I think like that can cut both ways wherein uh, I, I do not know the answer. Okay, how do you choose that skill? But I do believe that that problem is not particular to RSEs wherein people might have to take that decision anyway, but you can add the RSE context to it later. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. 
Um, what do you think about student uh, student competitions in the sense as it is common in HPC with student cluster competitions? Again, yeah, uh, I do not have any experience with that, but that sounds like a good idea because I think we did have a call for the HPC competition uh, recently and there were RSEs participating and working with students as mentors. So it might be a good idea to have those competitions in general uh, and just not for HPC. So we, if we can have something for research software or if we can have something which can maybe say uh, provide students with a hackathon or something, maybe even art projects uh, that they can work on or they can try their hands on, that might be a good idea to give them sort of a small slice of what it's like being an RSC. So yeah, I think that's definitely a good idea. But yeah, thank you so much for your questions. And if anyone is interested uh, in this project or wants to have a chat about it, please do grab me and I would love to chat. Thank you again. Thank you.